We continue. It is the Jake Asman Show right here, Sports Map Radio. And now joining us on our progressive guest line to talk all things Jets, all things NFL draft, was one of my favorite players when he played for the New York Jets. Now he's a big-time media star after playing 10 years in the National Football League. He is former Jets defensive lineman, Leger Doosable. Leger, I appreciate your time as always. Thanks for being with us. Of course, Jake. You know, it's always a good time when we, we get on, you know, talk a little football. So we were chopping it up off air. You told me that you're actually going to be working for SNY for the upcoming draft covering the Jets up close. So, you know, let, let's start with the Jets. They do have that number two pick. All signs point to Zach Wilson being the guy. Leger, you've been around some really good quarterbacks in your career. When you watch Zach Wilson, evaluate him as a prospect, what do you think he does really well and, and what type of player are the Jets getting? Well, the first thing that comes to mind when you're talking about Zach Wilson's arm strength, I happened to call the UCF games throughout the season, and they played UCF in the bowl game last year in the Boca Bowl, and, and this guy is amazing. He has great mobility in the pocket. He's a better athlete than people give him credit for. And his decision-making, he had a lot of turnovers in 2019, but he rectified that in 2020, didn't really turn the ball over. Comes from a pro-style offense, which to me is a big plus in this transition going into the NFL. I think he'll be the most – quarterback ready uh, rookie coming into this draft class and the guy has all the t- uh, intangible he has the moxie you you've seen the pro days on NFL Network and ESPN the guy can spin it he's everything you want in a quarterback and I think it's a no-brainer for them to to pick Zach Wilson at number two now I wouldn't be mad if they took Justin Fields another guy to me who has the highest ceiling in this class just because of the athletic ability and the ability to to buy time in the pocket when plays break down and make plays down the field with his legs and his arm. To me, he has the highest ceiling in this class, but to me, the most quarterback-ready rookie coming into the NFL has to be Zach Wilson. When you watched him play up close against UCF, I mean, could you tell that, you know, this guy had special traits? I mean, did you did you see it in person firsthand? Like, take us through the experience of actually watching a guy play, because many of us Jet fans, I mean, yeah, we turned on BYU maybe once or twice. We watched some highlights, yeah. but you saw it in person. So what was that experience like? Yeah, well, first and foremost, uh, Jake, I didn't even know he was going to play in the game. Like, um, that shows what type of player he is, right? He had everything to lose by playing in this game. He had kind of solidified himself as going as a top 10 pick. But he wanted to go out there. The kid just loves football. And, you know, he really grew with that team. You know, BYU is a close-knit family. A lot of those guys go on mission trips, and, and they're around each other 24-7. So he wanted to go out there and lay it on the line for his fellas one more time. I believe they pulled him at halftime. And it sucks to say that being a UCF night that he was able to leave the game at halftime because they were blowing us out of the water. But, you know, his last game playing as a BYU Cougar, you could tell the coach really wanted to have some fun. They literally used all aspects of his game, right? They put him on the run, and then they used him some in some bootlegs. They actually threw him the ball once, Jack, and he showed his receiving skills in that game. And then they even threw a flea flicker to show the type of arm strength he has and throwing the ball down the field. Like I said, this kid has it all. He has the moxie. Comes from a pro-style offense to me, which is a really big plus because a lot of these kids are coming from – you know, that 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 spread offense where they really only have one read, but this guy can go and make the reads, make the changes at the line of scrimmage and get you into the right play. He showed all that during that game versus UCF in his final co- collegiate career game in college. This kid has it all. I think, like I said, it's a no-brainer um, at the number two pick. Again, I wouldn't be mad if the Jets went Justin Field because I believe he has the most upside in this draft class, but I think – as far as quarterback is being ready coming in as a rookie, I think Zach Wilson is the top tier guy. Leger Doosable, Jordan is here, of course, ten year veteran in the NFL, now doing some work with SNY, and you can check him out. He's all over Twitter. If you're if you're into NFL takes, you got to follow our guy Leger Doosable. <laughs> Let me ask you this, you know, just looking at, you know, kind of where the Jets are as a team right now. You you look at the Sam Darnold trade. They now have 21 total picks over the next two drafts. We know Joe Douglas has preached building through the draft. Based on what you know about Joe and some of the moves the Jets have made this offseason, what's your level of confidence that he's the right guy to execute this rebuild? I have a lot of confidence in Joe D. I like what he does. He always likes to build from the inside out, right? The meat and potatoes, the offense and defensive line. You saw last year he really tried to reconstruct that offensive line, going with Makai Beckton, getting McGovern, re-signing Alex Lewis, trying to, you know, and then signing George Frant at right tackle, trying to build it the right way through the offensive and defensive line. And you saw this year he went to the defensive side of the ball. We're getting Carl, we get Carl Lawson to me, which is the still a free agency, especially at defensive end. He doesn't have the gaudy sack numbers, but had a lot of pressure, and he would have had more sacks, 
but he didn't really get that interior push. Well, now he won't have that issue, right? He's playing with big Quentin Williams, a guy that can get that pressure up the middle, seven and a half sacks last year. And then he added on Sheldon Rankins. And if this guy can stay healthy, he might be the steal of free agency. This guy routinely, when he's healthy, can get eight plus sacks in the interior. So you're talking about two guys getting seven plus sacks in the inside. That's going to up Carl Lawson's sack, sack numbers on the outside because he won't be getting double teamed. In Cincinnati, he was the, the focal point of the rush this past year, especially when Carlos Dunlap got traded. Um, Geno Atkins was banged up a little bit this year, so he didn't get that push up the middle that he's routinely getting. So now he'll get that push up the middle, and the quarterback will have to hold the ball a little bit longer, and hopefully you know, Carl Lawson can collect on some of those sacks, some of those sack fumbles, get some of those turnovers. That's how Robert Salah crafts his team, right? Through the offense and defensive line when he was in San Francisco, he had a great defensive line, a six-man rotation. I think adding Vinnie Curry, a guy that's had a lot of experience, had a lot of success at defensive end, a veteran guy you bring into that room, I think that was a really big signing for us. So our defensive line is looking good. I, I think we definitely need to address this, the secondary and the draft. I like, I like our safety rotation, but at corner, we definitely got to get a guy that's going to be the number one corner coming out of this draft. Totally agree with you. And, you know, you're the perfect guy to talk about, you know, the Jets defensive line to talk about the Jets next head coach, of course, and Robert Sala. You have experience with Coach Sala. So can you tell the Jet fan the type of coach that he is and how you think his personality, his style of coaching, how that translates the coaching, you know, in, in the New York market and the pressure and the circumstance that comes with being the Jets head coach? Yeah, I'll tell you a little story. So going into my 10th year, I was getting ready to sign with San Francisco. I actually asked a few of my, my former teammates, Sindari Mark, uh, Paul Plus and Leslie, um, how, you know, Robert Sala was. And they were like, you're going to love this guy. He's full of energy. He's a great teacher of men. And I saw that as soon as I got there. He's still the coach, the only coach that I know to this day that wears cleats out to the football field because he's chasing after the ball before the defensive players are chasing after the ball. That's the type of juice this guy's bringing day in and day out. And then every day in defensive meeting room, he would have like a brain teaser for us just to wake us up. Because a lot of times those meetings can be long and dreadful, but he would have your mind thinking to get you ready to go on that practice field. So this is a guy that's a great leader of men. He's going to bring juice and energy to practice every day. And, and this is a head coach that probably could fight any other head coach in the NFL. If you see this guy, he, he if you see him before games, he's running up and down the stadium, stairs at different stadiums, trying to stay in shape. Like I said, this guy's going to bring a lot of juice on that sideline. And Jet fans should be ecstatic because I think he's the right guy to take us to the, to the next level. I mean, he looks like he could fight anyone at any given time. And Leger, how about Joe Douglas? I mean, you talk about a tag yeah. team of Douglas and Salah. Well, they're going to no, leave. No, no, nobody <laughs> wants any smoke with our GM and head coach, 100%. Joe D looks like he can put some hands on somebody, and so does uh, Robert Salah. <laughs> no, no question about that. A 10 year NFL vet, Leger Doosable, with us right here on the Jake Asbid Show at Sports Map Radio. You know, looking at the rest of the Jets draft, you, you referenced yeah. getting a corner. You, of course, you know, know how important it is to build up that offensive line. You know, the Jets not only have picks next year, which we covered, but even in this year's draft, right? You're talking about, yeah. I think, four picks in the top 68 of the draft. Exactly. So the Jets have an opportunity to really hit on some key players here, specifically with pick 23, Leger. Do you think it's more important yeah. for them to go interior offensive line, cornerback? If you were Joe Douglas, what would you do with that 23rd pick? It's so tough, right? Because a, a lot of people have slated that spot for a running back, Travis Etienne, who I think would be a great pickup for the Jets, a guy that could grow with Zach Wilson, a guy when, you know, on third down when Zach Wilson's in trouble, he can dump the ball off to him and he can make plays. I think he's perfect for the first the floor system coming over from, you know, Kyle Shanahan in San Francisco. He's the perfect running back for the zone scheme, the, the cut one time, get downhill, and he's going to get downhill fast, or he has enough speed to get to the edge and break away. And then the screen game was something that was so big in San Francisco with Kyle Shanahan. And you saw Raheem Mostert have a lot of success at, at times. You saw Tevin Coleman have a lot of success there. And if even if you go back to Devontae Freeman and Atlanta, he had a lot of success in that screen game. Well, this is a guy, Travis Etienne, who catches the ball out of the backfield and is a home run threat, could take you know the ball the distance. And I was really surprised that he was able to put on weight and keep up that speed. And we saw that at his pro day. But, you know, I'm always iffy about taking running backs in the first round. I hate to say that, um, but I think he would be a great pick. Honestly, I would not be surprised if, you know, with, with us having a defensive-minded coach that's going corner at that, you know, number 20-something pick. Say a, a J.C. Horn slips or maybe a, a Caleb Farley, who I would be a little bit, you know, cognizant of drafting just because of the injury history or, or Greg Newsom, I think. But either way, I think 
by the second round, they have to address that corner position. That's that's one position that we have to address in this draft. I personally would love if somehow Najee Harris or Etienne, someone falls out of that first round because of the yeah. order. can't take a running back in round one. And the Jets. That's what I was thinking too, because we got a high pick in the second round. So I, I, I could see us maybe taking a corner and and praying that I don't think Najee will fall. I could see Travis Etienne maybe falling a little bit if he was able to fall, or even a Williams from from North Carolina if the, if he's at the top of the second or end of the second round. I could see us pulling the trigger on the Etienne, and the, you know I think it, what is it pick uh, thirty four we have in the second round. So I could see us getting him if he falls. I don't see him falling into the second round, but if he does. You know that would that would be great for the Jets, but that twenty second, uh, twenty second, the twenty second pick, I believe, twenty second or twenty third pick, I can see the Jets, you know, getting Travis Etienne or, or going corner there. You know, when I look at your career, Lejay, what I love, you know, of course, being the Jet fan that I am, is that you consider yourself a Jet, right? I mean, I know you played for the yeah. Jets longer than any other team, but I felt like the fan base of you, you guys had such a great relationship, such a great connection. One hundred percent. You played for a ton of other teams. Why do you have that connection to the Jets organization and that connection to the fan base? I think me and the Jets fan base are like one and the same, right? We're we're kind of like the the rugged, you know, forgotten, you know, and I don't want to say forgotten because to me the Jet fan, fan base is one of the most passionate fan bases in all of you know of the NFL period. And if you look at New York, yeah, there might be more Giant fans, but the Jet fans are definitely more passionate, right? They remind me of like hard worker, blue collar workers. That's kind of like how I was, how my career was. Like I had to scrap and fight for everything. And I think that Jet Nation really, you know, took to me because of that, because we were like one and the same. So I think that's why we've always had such a great relationship. And it started when I got here with Rex Ryan, because that's how he was, you know, he was a scrappy guy, um, wasn't going to take, you know, no stuff off of anybody. And I think Jet Nation really, you know, kind of like feels that way. And that's how they, you know, they've been brought up. And a lot of those Jet fans have been fans since they were toddlers. You know, as soon as they came out the womb, they were Jet fans and they don't care what anybody or their friends or other family members say, like they're going to represent the Jets year in and year out. And that's one of the most passionate fan bases I've ever played for. Like, like I said, they might not have the numbers that the Giants have, but as far as passion, I mean, it's second to none. No doubt about that. I'm glad you brought up Rex Ryan. You know, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you, your favorite Rex Ryan story. I mean, not only do you play for him with the Jets, but then Rex goes to Buffalo, and one of his first moves is to make sure he brings you in to, to help out that defensive line. Yeah, uh, man, there's so so many Rex stories. I don't I don't know if I just got one. I mean, Rex was Rex was the funniest when it was just improv too. Like it wasn't like something that he planned. Like just some stuff that he would say. Like some of our conversations that I'll keep off camera were, were just some of the best. And I still have a relationship to him to this day, man. I can't thank him enough because I felt like that his defense was tailored for my skill set. And it took me to year six in the NFL to get with a coach that was tailored to the skill set that I had. And I can't thank him enough. He really like resurrected my career, especially coming off the injury. I was coming off a, a pec tear when I got with Rex and he really resurrected, you know, my career because at a year four, I was one of the, you know, top defensive ends in the league. And then, uh, you know, I had to do a one year prove it deal because, you know, especially as an undrafted guy, they want to make sure you can do it multiple times. I ended up tearing my pec. So it was like I had to reinvent myself and, and all, you know, all that stuff that I built up, it kind of went away when I tore my pec. So when I got to Rex and I felt like this defense was just tailor made for me, it helped me prolong my career. And as you said, play 10 years in the NFL. 10 years in the NFL, an incredible run for, for what you were able to accomplish. Jeff fans will forever love you, LeJay. We're glad that you're now part of SNY's draft coverage. And, you know, obviously, you got to check out LeJay on Twitter as well, at LeJay Ducible is where you can find him. LeJay, always a blast to catch up with you. Drafts next week. Jet fans are excited. and We're looking forward to watching you on TV as well. Appreciate it, Jake, man. I'm excited too. Can't wait. We're almost there. Almost hey. about a week away. <laughs> Thanks for watching the full YouTube video. If you like what you saw, then please, please subscribe to my page for more content. Thank you.